Old Testament poetic books are among the greatest literature ever written. They express the song of the soul, the passion of the heart. Uh, they combine musical lyric uh, with the depth of biblical truth as the writers of Old Testament poetry pour out their heart and soul to God. In some of these poetic books, uh, we'll see wonderful love songs of passion and romance. On the other hand, we'll see songs of great uh, suffering and agony of soul. And then we'll see in the Psalms themselves songs of praise and hymns of worship to God. And in the books of Proverbs, we'll see the wisdom of the Lord as it's expressed in cryptic sayings, uh, sort of like a plaque that you could hang on your wall and they're truths to live by and hang your life on and build your life on. The poetic books are unique in all of biblical literature because they're an expression of the worship of the people of God. We know more about the Jewish people and what they were really like spiritually and personally from the books of poetry than any other part of Scripture. Now, when we look at the poetic books, we want to remind ourselves that the theme in these books is the aspiration for Christ Himself. They are aspiring to know the Lord in a personal and intimate way. When we're in the books of history, uh, we're looking at the rise and fall of nations, the conflict, the political uh, processes that are going on in Israel. But when we come to the poetic books, all of that is set aside. And you see the heart and soul of people as they really are and as they aspire for a relationship personally with the Lord himself. And the promise in the poetic books is that the Messiah is coming who will fulfill every one of those needs and those desires. There are five poetic books altogether. Uh, they begin in our English Bible with the book of Job. The emphasis there is on salvation by the Redeemer. Uh, Job is going through personal problems and tragedies and difficulties and struggles and cries out unto the Lord uh, and says, even though worms destroy this body, even though I die, yet in my flesh I'll see my Redeemer and stand before Him in the last day. The second book of poetry in our Bible is the book of Psalms, uh, the longest book in all of the Bible and certainly the longest book in the Old Testament. 150 songs of praise that emphasize communion with God. Uh, the book of Psalms is a collection of songs of worship sung by the Jewish people. Uh, we love them and value them because they are universal in their application. Uh, people who know God and love God can sing these same psalms and identify with them because they express the heart and soul of the people of God. And then the third book is the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs, you have the expression of the wisdom of God. The Proverbs are written uh, as wise sayings. Every verse virtually is a standalone truth, uh, encapsulated truth in a simple form that helps us understand what life is all about. In the Proverbs, the emphasis is on how to live life here on earth, how to make the best uh, of the opportunities that God has given you. And then in the fourth book, the book of Ecclesiastes, the writer of Ecclesiastes is asking the question, what is the meaning and purpose of life? What is it all about anyhow? Why am I here? Where am I going? How am I going to get there? And the fifth book, the Song of Solomon, emphasizes our union with Christ. Uh, it's a love song uh, that a couple would have written about their courtship how they met in their relationship as it grows and blossoms into love and uh, their desire to be married to one another uh, and then the promise that is made by the lover uh, that I will one day return for you and come back for you and marry you and take you home to the palace, to the Father's house. A beautiful picture of the love of Jesus Christ who also promises the bride of Christ that I'll return for you one day and take you home to the Father's house. As we launch into our study of these five poetic books, we're going to be looking at and reading parts of these books that express the heart and soul and character of the very people of God. And my prayer is that you'll let these books speak to your heart as well. Some of you may be going through a time of difficulty as in the book of Job. You may be facing great personal hurt and heartache and tragedy and be wondering, where is God? in all of this. The book of Job 
gives us the answer. Some may be wanting to just burst out in song and worship and praise to the Lord, and you'll find expressions of that in the Psalms. And then also in the Psalms, we'll find prophecies of the coming of Christ, the Messianic Psalms that predict that the Savior is coming. And then some of us need a little help and advice on how to live life wisely and effectively, and you're going to find that in the Proverbs and in the book of Ecclesiastes. And then ultimately, all of us have a desire for a closer relationship with the Lord, and we're going to find an expression of that in the Song of Solomon. As we look at these poetic books, let me remind you that there are several poetic periods, so to speak. Uh, The book of Job, for example, goes all the way back to the earliest part of the Old Testament. It's patriarchal in nature. Uh, Job is uh, living in ancient times, in the ancient world. Uh, He's the greatest man of the ancient East, the Bible says. Uh, When you read the story of his life, he sounds like an Abraham. Uh, Some have suggested that it may even be the oldest book in all of the Bible. And then the second book, the book of Psalms, comes from the Davidic period, from the time of King David. Now, there are psalms written by others. There's a psalm by Moses and uh, psalms by several of the choir directors of ancient Israel. But for the most part, the book of Psalms is written by King David himself. And then the third section comes from the Solomonic period from King Solomon. And these include the Song of Solomon, probably written when he was a young man uh, and uh, desperately in love. Uh, The book of Proverbs written in his middle-aged years when he's looking at life saying, here's what works and here's what doesn't work. Uh, Here's practical wisdom. Build your life on this basis. And then many have suggested that the book of Ecclesiastes may have been written when he was elderly, when he was at the end of his life and he's looking back over his life and saying to himself, what was it really all about anyhow? Uh, What is the meaning and purpose of life? Now, when we talk about Old Testament poetry, we're talking about an expression of writing that is very different than English poetry. Old Testament poetry is written in a series of parallels, parallel thoughts and expressions that are repeated. It doesn't rhyme like English poetry. Roses are red, violets are blue, I like you, and so does who, or whatever. It it doesn't work that way. Old Testament Hebrew poetry is very lyrical, it's very musical, it is written in a kind of meter, uh, but because of the nature of the Hebrew language, it is not a language that is easily rhymed, so the rhyme comes, so to speak, in the parallels of thought that are constantly repeated. So that when we're looking at Old Testament poetry, uh, we have to understand the nature of the poetic expression isn't always intended to be taken literally. Uh, The trees clap their hands, uh, for example. Trees don't literally have hands. The branches may clack together in the wind, uh, but the expression poetically there is designed to give us a word picture so that we might understand a concept of truth. Now, in Hebrew poetry, you have different kinds of parallels. You have synonymous parallels, uh, a parallel where the statement is said the same way twice. Uh, For example, in Proverbs 20, verse 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler. Notice wine and strong drink are in parallel with one another, and a mocker and a brawler are in parallel with one another. The same thing is said twice, but said for emphasis. You also get a practical truth in that particular statement. Uh, People who drink too much end up in fights and end up with all kinds of conflict and problems in their lives. Uh, Wine is the gateway to being a brawler. All you have to do is drive by a restaurant that uh, is known as a kind of a hangout late at night on a Saturday night, and you'll see the police are there in the parking lot and probably trying to break up a fight of some sort. The wisdom of of the poetic books of the Old Testament speaks to us 3,000 years later, down through the corridor of time, and reminds us that the nature and character of man hasn't changed, and the nature and character of God has not changed, that the wisdom of God is worth using to build your life upon. 
And then we have other kinds of parallels as well. We have an antithetic parallel, an opposite thought that is expressed. A wise son gladdens a father, but a foolish son grieves his mother. The wise son and the foolish son are opposites. The father and mother are opposites. But notice something here about Hebrew poetry. Just because it says a good son makes his father happy and a, and a foolish son breaks his mother's heart doesn't mean that we can say that when children turn out badly, uh, it really hurts the mother more than it does the father. That's not the point of the passage. The parallel is merely being expressed to get our attention and to help us understand the depth of the thought. That, again, is one of the things you have to remember when looking at Hebrew poetry. Uh, you cannot over-literalize it because the nature of the expression of it is intended by the parallel to re-emphasize the thought. The point here is simply that when children become a problem for their parents, uh, they make both parents sad. Uh, they break the heart of both mom and dad. And when they turn out good, they gladden the heart of both mother and father. And then third type of parallelism that you have in the Old Testament is called a synthetic parallel, where the thoughts build one upon another. Uh, you have an example of this in uh, Psalm 1. It says of the godly man, he is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in all he does, he prospers. The tree is the word picture. Planted by the water, there is a source of life for the tree. It produces leaves. It produces fruit. In the same way, so is a godly person who is filled with the Spirit of God. His life is abundant and prosperous uh, and fruitful. It's a word picture to help us understand a truth from the Word of God. And then you have exemplar parallels as well where there is an idea that is communicated that is an example by which we understand a truth. In Proverbs 27, 17, the Bible says, As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. In other words, as you would take an iron file to sharpen your sword, uh, so two men in their intellectual and spiritual interaction with one another sharpen one another. Uh, two athletes sharpen one another as they compete against each other. Uh, if you're running in a race uh, against a, a runner that is inferior to you, you won't put forth quite as much effort. But if you're running against somebody that you know is every bit as fast as you are, you're going to have to run your best, run your fastest. You're going to have to give everything you have in order to win the race. One man sharpens the other and brings out the best. So it is that in our personal lives and in our spiritual lives, as we interact with each other, we're to sharpen and strengthen one another. We're not to live our Christian life in a vacuum, but we're to live it in such a way that it is an expression of the fact that God is at work in our lives and in our communal relationships with people, we are living not as monks in isolation, but in a community in the body of the local church where we encourage and help and sharpen one another. And then you have another kind of parallelism that is a little more complicated. It's called external internal parallels. Uh, Hear ye the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of the Lord, you people of Gomorrah. Uh, the word of the Lord and the law of the Lord are the parallels. Sodom and Gomorrah are the parallels, but here they're used poetically. Sodom and Gomorrah had long since been destroyed. Uh, the writer is saying, uh, even to the Jewish people, that if you are living in sin, away from God, uh, you're like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, who should have listened to the Word of God uh, and to the things of God. The emphasis in the poetry is helping communicate to us truths about God Himself. The purpose of the poetic books uh, is several fold. First of all, it emphasizes praise to God. Praise Him for His acts in creation. Uh, in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. Uh, praise Him for His salvation in Psalm 16, uh, that the Lord is our Savior and our Redeemer, uh, and God is the one that ultimately will bring us back to life from the edge of death uh, and redeem our lives. Uh, 
uh, for his providential care in our lives. In Psalm 139, that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, that I'm not an accident of chance, that I'm the unique creation of God, uh, that his will and purpose in my life is being uh, expressed by his providential care and his personal choices for my life. And then thank God for his blessings. Uh, In Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Forget not all of his benefits. And then he lists all the things that God has blessed him with. Uh, It is a psalm of thanksgiving. Uh, Thank the Lord for his redemption, that he is the redeemer. Uh, the Savior, uh, the one who redeems us from sin, from uh, spiritual widowhood, and marries us and brings us into the family of God. And then several times in the Psalms, you have an emphasis on the loving kindness of the Lord. In Hebrew, it's the word chesed. Uh, It's the idea of the the grace and goodness of God uh, that is extended to us like the unmerited favor of grace uh, combined with the agape love of the New Testament. Uh, And in Psalm 51, when David has sinned against the Lord and he repents and his heart is broken and he's crushed, uh, he cries out and says, I am not abandoned, Lord, by your loving kindness. I throw myself on the mercy of God and the loving kindness of God, the chesed of God, that you uh, will forgive my sin and cleanse my soul. Uh, These are expressions of worship that are part of the experience of the people of God who are praising the Lord. And then the poetic books are also used as liturgical expressions of worship at the feasts of worship. Uh, At Passover, Believe it or not, they read the Song of Solomon, the love song, uh, because the death of the Passover lamb was the expression of the love of God for the people of God. Uh, At Pentecost, they read the book of Ruth because Pentecost was a feast of harvest uh, when they brought in the first fruits of the harvest and uh, because in in the book of Ruth, they're harvesting the grain and they're gleaning the scraps and uh, the wealthy man from Bethlehem comes out and falls in love with her, uh, they would read this book at the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, At the Feast of Ab, which commemorates the destruction of Jerusalem, They would very appropriately read the book of Lamentations, which was written poetically by the prophet Jeremiah as he watched Jerusalem burn and the temple come to the ground. And then in the Feast of Purim, which comes right out of the book of Esther, uh, they would naturally read the book of Esther and remember that God had used this incredible young woman to spare the Jewish people and the line of the Messiah himself liturgical usages of the songs and psalms and poetic expressions of the Old Testament. Now, you want to remember that poetry is not limited just to the poetic books. We find poetry in some of the expressions of the prophets. Isaiah, a very poetic prophet. Uh, We find examples of poetry in the songs that are sung throughout the Old Testament. But poetry was also used to convey wisdom. Uh, the chokhmah of God, uh, that God is the source of wisdom, that wisdom is the rationale of the cosmos. It's the logic of God himself that the world makes sense. And then also that ultimately wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord, that when I really trust God and believe in him and fear him in the sense that I awe him and I have respect for him. My respect of God is the beginning of wisdom. I will not live my life foolishly. I will not live stupidly because I realize God is there. God has made me. Uh, God has a purpose in my life. And that purpose is to be fulfilled in the work of God in my heart and in my soul. So poetry used as an expression of praise to God, the song of the heart. Uh, It's used liturgically in worship, uh, and it's used to express the very wisdom and character and nature of God to help us understand how to build our lives better, more effectively, more successfully. Uh, The song of praise says, thank you that I'm on my way to heaven. The wisdom of the proverb says, but before I get there, how am I going to live my life here on earth? How am I going to live in such a way that my life is an expression of the very wisdom and character of God himself? And then the expressions of wisdom, 
are given in several poetic forms in the Old Testament. Uh, the proverb is the wise saying. Uh, the riddle is the difficult saying that has to be interpreted, has to be understood. What does this actually mean? Uh, there are parables in the Old Testament. Uh, there is an incident in the book of Judges uh, where a parable is expressed because Abimelech has uh, acted like the thorn bush and is going to come under the judgment of God. Uh, in the New Testament, Jesus, of course, taught in parables extensively, earthly stories with a heavenly meaning, it's often been said, uh, a kind of word picture, a agricultural illustration of a spiritual truth, taking the elements of everyday life and reminding us that they teach us biblical and spiritual truths. And then the analogy, where you use something as an analogy of a truth, like the tree planted by the waters, is an analogy of the godly life that is rooted in the Spirit of God. And then certainly the expression of wisdom comes in the songs as well, that these are songs that express the nature and character of God. The themes in the wisdom literature deal with the nature of man, uh, his finiteness, his inadequacy, his intelligence, and yet his stupidity at the same time, uh, his ability and yet his inability. We begin to see the struggle of the human heart and soul to be like God, and yet realizing I am not God. Therefore, I need the touch of God in my heart and soul. Uh, you have concepts of retributive justice uh, in the Psalms. Oh, God, deal with my enemies. Strike them dead. Bring judgment upon them. Uh, I can't uh, deal with this any longer, etc. Uh, there is an honesty in Old Testament poetry. Uh, these are not just all happy, happy songs in the Psalms. Some of them express disappointment and frustration and agony. Uh, God, where are you? Have you abandoned me? Have you forgotten me? Don't you realize I'm surrounded by my enemies who are trying to kill me? Where are you in all of this? Honest expressions of the depth of the soul of the human struggle. And yet one of the things that's very characteristic of the poetic books is the universalism of them. In this sense, they express universal truths, not a universalistic salvation, not that everybody's saved, only those that know the Lord, but they express universal concepts that are applicable to all people in all times. The Old Testament saints can read them. The New Testament saints can read them. Uh, people could read them in the days of the disciples, and people can read these truths uh, in the 21st century. Uh, and they still apply to our lives today. And then in the poetic books, you also have an emphasis on the desire for eternal life. That God, you have set eternity in the hearts of men. They aren't satisfied with anything else. There is a deep craving and longing to know you and to live forever that once around is not enough. Tell me how I can know you and know you forever and live for all eternity. Each one of these expressions of poetry reminds us that there is a God of love, a God of justice, who has a sense of meaning and purpose in the universe, who has created us in the image and likeness of God, and he has not abandoned us unto ourselves, but he gives us an expression of his love and his truth in every challenge of life. Now, as we get into the poetic books, the first book of poetry in the Old Testament is the book of Job, uh, a book that expresses the agony of the human heart, the agony of the human soul. Here is a man who is a good man, uh, and everything goes wrong in his life. He answers the question, why do bad things happen to good people? So if you have your Bible, take it and turn to the book of Job, and then in your notes, make sure you turn to the section on Job, and notice the picture of Christ in the book of Job is the redeemer of life. When all of life goes wrong, when I am reduced to a pile of ashes, when there's nothing left but heartache and tragedy, Job said I had to look up and remember, my redeemer is still alive, and one day he'll take my life and bring it back and resurrect me, and I'll stand before him in the last days. The ancient book of Job, set in the era of the patriarchs, also speaks to us today 
about the agony of human tragedy and the struggle of understanding where is God when everything goes wrong. The book's author is unknown. Some have suggested maybe it was written by Moses, but it's not part of the law. Others say maybe Elihu, the young man that appears in the book. Uh, But the truth is, we don't know for sure who wrote the book of Job. When was it written? It appears to have been written in the patriarchal era. There is no reference to the law of Moses in the book, so it seems to predate the law. The name God Almighty is used 30 times uh, in preference to Lord Jehovah. And then you have long lifespans. People live a long time. Uh, The city of Uz, where he's located, or the land of Uz, is near Midian, uh, where Moses uh, ran when he fled from God uh, and fled from the Egyptians. Uh, And then the family clan unit seems to also be pre-Mosaic. That is, it comes before the time uh, of the Israelites and the establishment of the nation of Israel. Uh, Either way, we understand that we have in the book of Job a very ancient book. It's written to suffering believers uh, who are struggling with what is all of my problem and difficulty really all about, who were located, we don't know where, perhaps in the land of Midian, but in reality, anywhere, at any time. The purpose of the book. Why was it written? To teach divine sovereignty in both blessing and suffering. That God is sovereign in the blessings in our lives as well as in allowing problems and difficulties and challenges to come into our lives. Uh, When we look at the biblical map and we get the setting Uh, that uh, there is this great man from the land of us. The scripture says uh, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. Where was that? Somewhere in the Sinai Peninsula, apparently. Somewhere in Midian. Uh, in those ancient uh, communities that settled in the Sinai where certain people rose to wealth and prominence and Job is depicted as one of the wealthiest of all of the ancient patriarchs. Uh, The theme of the book obviously has to do with suffering. Uh, The scripture says everything went wrong in his life. Why? And it gives us several perspectives. Uh, You see, the greatness of poetry is it allows the author to give us several facets, several views, several angles, if you will, as you turn from one angle to another, from one perspective to another, to look at the problem. The author in the book uh, says, in essence, suffering is pernicious. Uh, Satan was behind the scenes, stirring up much of this trouble. Uh, Job himself says, suffering is a puzzle. It's serious. It's terrible. I'm the one going through it, and I don't understand. And usually while you're in the problem, you don't understand. Don't expect that you're going to figure it all out while you're in the depth of the crisis. I remember talking to a friend once who was struggling with cancer. He had a wonderful, miraculous recovery eventually. But while he was in the depth of the problem and the seriousness of the treatments and all the rest of that, people would say, well, what great lesson is God teaching you? And he'd say, I don't know. I'm just trying to stay alive and survive from one day to the next. Uh, For the sufferer, uh, sometimes it's not obvious what it's all about until it's over. Uh, the view of Job's friends was that suffering is penal. It's a punishment uh, because of sinful behavior. Job, you must have done something wrong. God must be mad with you because look what he's done to you. And then Elihu, the young man who steps in at the end of the book, says, well, wait, suffering can also purify us of our shortcomings. It's not always an act of God against our sinful behavior. Sometimes it's a way of cutting the rough edges off smoothing and shaping the life and the soul and the character. And then God speaks in the end of the book and says that suffering is providential. Uh, It's controlled by the sovereignty of God, that he will not allow you to suffer any more than he chooses to. He puts limits on Satan. He says, yes, you can put your hand against Job, but you can only go so far. Don't touch his body. And then when he says you can touch his body, he says don't take his life. Uh, Even suffering that takes me all the way to the point of death ends at death that God has put a limit on suffering, that God will not normally put more on us 
then he will put in us to enable us to endure the problems and the pressures and the difficulties of life. His working in our lives in times of pain and difficulty is often the greatest work that he ever does. C.S. Lewis, the Christian scholar, said that pain is God's megaphone by which he shouts to us to get our attention. When we're in agony of soul, we are crying out to God with the cry of the soul. The Bible is filled with examples with people who cried out with all of their heart and God heard them. The Israelites cried out in slavery and God delivered them. Uh, the prophet Elijah cries out to God and God hears him and sends the fire uh, and vindicates the prophet. The cry of the soul touches the very heart of God himself and God allows suffering uh, in order to get our attention to speak to us in a way that we would never listen under ordinary circumstances. If we're to outline the book of Job, we can outline it simply by dividing up some of the sections of the book. We begin with the first uh, three chapters, the affliction of Job, in which Job is the afflicted and Satan is the afflictor. Uh, take your Bible and notice what it says in that chapter. It says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and the man was perfect and upright, one that feared God and hated evil, a good man that tried to do everything right. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. He had 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and donkeys and a great household. And he was the greatest man of all the East, a wealthy, prosperous man. Uh, and, and the scripture says that he prayed continually for his family and his sons and his daughters. But there was a day, verse 6, when the sons of God, the B'nai Elohim, the biblical term for angels, came before the Lord, and Satan came also among them, reminding us that even though Satan has been cast out of his position uh, as Lucifer, as the uh, covering cherub of heaven, he still has access to the presence of God limited by the sovereignty of God, but he can still come before the Lord. And in the book of Job, God speaks to him and says, well, where have you come from? Uh, and Satan said in verse 7, I've come from going to and fro on all the earth and walking up and down in it. You know where I came from? Down there on the earth, wandering around, looking for whom I made a bower. That's what I'm doing. I'm looking for somebody to attack. Really? Well, have you considered my servant Job? Hey, in all your travels down there, Satan, have you ever met Job? Pretty good guy. Loves me, hates evil, prays for his family. Why, he's one of the best men on the planet. And Satan's attitude is, well, no kidding. You have blessed him abundantly. No wonder he loves you and he serves you. Look what you've done for him. You take all of his money away from him. You strike him and he'll turn against you and curse you to your face. And God said, I won't do it but I'll let you. I'm going to teach you a lesson about the doctrine of eternal security and eternal salvation. Put your hand against him, and he will not turn against me. God, what are you doing? You're going to allow the devil to touch one of your own servants, uh, to bring what would appear to be an act of judgment upon his life? How could you do this? Why would you do this? What is all of this going to be all about, uh, that the hand of God will turn against Job himself and that Job will suffer uh, under the touch of Satan. As we get into the book of Job, we're getting into a book that helps us understand uh, the tragedy of the human experience, that just because I'm saved and I'm on my way to heaven does not mean that I have an insurance policy against problems and difficulties. No, not at all. Even a believer can suffer difficulty and pain and tragedy and heartache. And yet in all of that, the book of Job says, God is at work. God is sovereign. As we move on, we'll see what God has to say to us through the book of Job.
the main substance of the book of Job is built around a poetic interchange between Job and his three friends in four rounds of conversation. But the book itself is bookended on both ends by a prosaic introduction and a conclusion in which the author of Job gives us a behind-the-scenes look into heaven at the conflict of spiritual warfare and a contest between God and Satan over the righteousness of Job. Uh, Satan's protested, take everything away from him, he'll turn against you. God said, you do it. Go right ahead, but don't put your hand on him. And the first chapter tells us that in one day, all of his children died in a terrible tragedy, that the Sabians and the Chaldeans came in and stole his cattle and his sheep, uh, that he lost all of his possessions, and the man who was the wealthiest man of the ancient East in one day is reduced to poverty. Everything goes wrong. The Bible says in verse 20 of chapter 1, And Job arose and ripped his clothes, shaved his head, fell on the ground, and worshipped. In spite of all this tragedy, he worships God and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked I will return again. The Lord has given, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In spite of this tragedy, most of us would have been crushed and ruined Remember, he not only loses his wealth, he loses his family and his children. Uh, Yet his heart is still fixed on God, that the God who has blessed me all these years can be trusted. I will still worship him. Then in chapter 2, you have another round of this, where Satan again comes before the Lord, apparently only occasionally, not constantly. Uh, And again the Lord said to him, Where have you come from? From walking to and fro on all the earth, he says. Uh, And he said, have you considered uh, Job down there? You took everything away from him, and he still will not curse me. He still retains his integrity. He still worships me. And finally, Satan said in verse 4 of chapter 2, yeah, skin for skin. Everything that a man has, he'll give for his own skin. You touch his body and take his health away from him, and then he'll turn against you. And God said, I won't touch him, but I'll let you. But you cannot take his life. Are there times that God allows pain and suffering and tragedy to come into our lives? Yes. The book of Job makes that clear. Does that mean that every problem, every pain, every difficulty uh, is necessarily from the Lord? Not necessarily. In this case, it was actually from Satan. And yet God providentially overruled all of it to speak to Job's heart and then through Job to speak to our hearts centuries later so that when we're in pain and tragedy, what do people do? They go right to the book of Job. Now, I have to remind our students on campus, most of whom are younger, right out of high school, studying Old Testament survey. I said, now, wait a minute. Let let me remind you of something. If you're 18 or 19 years old, you're not going to identify with the book of Job. Most of you aren't here right now. Life looks pretty good to you. Uh, Everything's exciting. Your future is ahead of you. You probably haven't gone through enough pain and enough suffering and enough difficulty yet to even understand the nature of what this book is all about. But trust me, the day will come that you will, Uh, that there will be problems in your life. And I want you to remember Job and go to this book. And if you read it in your pain, it will shout to you with volumes of truth. Now, at the end of the second chapter, Job's wife cracked. She's so upset. She says to him in verse 9, Job, look at you. You're, You're struck with disease. Your body is covered with boils. You're sitting in a pile of ashes, scraping yourself with a broken piece of pottery. You're pathetic. Why don't you just curse God and die? Give it up. Now, people criticize his wife, but let me remind you, She's the mother of those 10 children. Any woman who had lost 10 of her children in one day would be psychologically and spiritually devastated. She would be at the end of her rope. Let's not be too hard on her uh, because of all that she's gone through. She's not criticizing Job. She's just saying, honey, I just don't understand. How can you hang on any longer? Just give it up. End it. And Job said, no, no, I cannot receive good from the hand of God and not receive evil. And in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. 
Now, some suggest maybe in his heart. I don't know. But he did not foolishly charge God. You see, sometimes when things go wrong in our lives, we get so upset. We want to get mad at God. Who do you think you are? How could you let this happen to me? What kind of a God are you, etc.? Instead of being driven to our knees to say, God, what are you trying to say to me? Why am I really going through this? What is the meaning and purpose and significance in all of this? Job doesn't understand but he still wants to seek the Lord. Now, at the end of chapter 2, verse 11 on, his three friends came to try to comfort him in all of his tragedy and in all of his difficulty. Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, uh, and they enter into these four rounds of discussion with him that take up the whole book of Job. Uh, The Bible says that when they got there, uh, his agony was so deep they could hardly recognize him. They came to comfort him, uh, but they didn't even recognize him. Uh, And they sat down for seven days and nobody spoke a word. They just sat there in silence because his grief was so deep. Sometimes it's better to say nothing than to say the wrong thing. I remember many years ago, one of our students, a wonderful young lady, uh, was in love with a young man by the name of Frank, and he was tragically killed in an accident. Driving a motorcycle, a truckload of lumber ran into him and took his life immediately. Uh, A phone call came to me in my office saying, the students are on a bus. They're passing this accident right now. Uh, She's on that bus. She'll see the motorcycle. She'll see the body she'll probably realize who it is when they arrive at the parking lot. Somebody's got to go out and meet her. Ed, you go talk to her. And I remember as a young professor thinking, what in the world will I say to her? As soon as the bus stopped on the parking lot, she was the first one out the door with a look of agony on her face. And as soon as she saw me, she knew why I was there. Uh, And as I moved toward her and she burst into tears, sobbing, Something just said to me as God spoke to my heart, don't even try to explain this. Just hug her and let her cry. Just hold her and let her sob. Uh, She's got to express the the pain and the agony of her heart. Uh, She said, is it him? And I said, yes, that's all I said. And she said, is he? And I said, yes, he's gone. He's with the Lord. Uh, And even though we know someone has gone to heaven, that still doesn't take away the heartache of losing them, uh, the pain of missing them. Uh, And she probably cried for the next 30 minutes before we finally started to talk about what had happened. Years later, she was married and came by the campus one day to say, thank you for helping me through that time. I'll always miss Frank. I'll look forward to seeing him in heaven. But Here's the family that God has blessed me with in the meantime. Uh, Don't think you're God's expert to tell everybody what their pains and problems and difficulties are all about. When I was a college student, God had moved my heart to change schools from one school to the next, and I was involved within a few weeks in a terrible car accident. Uh, I broke my nose, broke my left arm. My youth pastor was from the school I'd left, and he showed up at the hospital and looked at me and said, well, that's probably what God did for you for leaving such and such a school. And God said to me, no, that's not it at all, Ed. I want you to know that even in this problem, I am with you, and I have not abandoned you. The poetic sections begin in the third chapter. Look what happens. It says, then Job opened his mouth. They didn't speak, so Job spoke and cursed his day. And he said, let the day perish wherein I was born and the night in which it is said that a male child is conceived. Notice the poetic parallel, born uh, and conceived. Uh, In other words, what he's saying is, I wish I'd never been born. Guys, this is the worst thing ever. I just can't imagine how terrible this is. Uh, He's not cursing God. He's cursing the day in which he was born. I wish I'd never been born because if I hadn't been born, I wouldn't have gone through all these things. It would have been easier if I'd have just died in the womb before I was born. And then the friends begin to give their insight, their input as to what they think is going on. The attitude of his friends can be identified this way. Uh, Norm Geisler's pointed this out often in his introduction to the Old Testament. Eliphaz speaks as the theologian talking about the greatness of God, that there is a great God in heaven, and you must have offended God. You surely have made him angry, Job. You must have done something for 
God to bring this judgment upon you like this. Bildad is the traditionalist who emphasizes the principles of justice, that there's a sense of right and wrong, of justice and injustice in the universe. Uh, and Job, you must have violated those principles of justice to come under something like this. And Zophar is the moralist who speaks of the concept of human wisdom. Uh, in other words, you must have done something real stupid, Job. Uh, either God is mad at you, you have done some unjust thing and you're suffering the consequences thereof, or you've just done something really stupid. Uh, you should have had more guards protecting the sheep and you should have built a stronger, better house so it wouldn't have fallen down and whatever. And they go at it for 30 chapters or more. Uh, discussing back and forth, and Job keeps protesting his innocence. I'm innocent. I really haven't done anything wrong. I don't know why this is happening to me. I cannot explain it. Uh, and finally, in his desperation, he cries out and calls out, God, what is happening? And a young man speaks up uh, named Elihu in chapters 32 to 37, uh, who interrupts these old men having this discussion and says as the young observer, uh, let, let me just kind of, maybe I could give a perspective here. I, I hesitate to speak, but uh, have you ever considered that maybe suffering purifies us and strengthens our lives and it's not always a punishment for sin? His friends keep telling him, you've done something wrong. Job keeps saying, no, I haven't. Elihu says, well, maybe he hasn't, but maybe there's still a meaning and a purpose in all of this. God is up to something here. God knows what he's doing in your life. And uh, finally, in the end of the book, God himself speaks and answers Job in chapters 38 to 40. Uh, in the closing chapters of the book, finally, the Lord answers him. Look at chapter 38, verse 1 in your Bible. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, out of the depth of the problems. Uh, and he begins to interrogate him. God gives the final exam. Uh, he says, who is this that darkens counsel without words of knowledge? What's this stupidity I hear down there? Guard up your loins like a man and I will question you and you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Oh, yeah, I wasn't here, actually. Uh, where were you when I laid out the measure of it? Uh, where were you when I laid the foundation? Where were you when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy? Do you understand even how the planet works, Job? Why do the rivers run into the sea and the sea is never full? Well, I really, I never thought of that before. I really don't know, etc. And God goes on questioning him and questioning him and questioning him. And finally, Job confesses his ignorance. I don't know everything. I don't understand always why you do what you do. Good, God said. Now you're in a position to hear my answer. And as to your friends, God turns around and rebukes his three friends. Uh, I'm not happy with them at all because they have said the wrong thing about you. Job, after God questions him, finally in chapter 42, verse 6 says, I abhor myself, I hate myself, I repent in dust and ashes. And God said, good. Now you're exactly where you need to be for me to work in your life, Job. And then the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends and God gave him twice as much as he had before. And, and then you get the bookend at the end of the book that God blessed the latter end of Job more than the beginning in verse 12 of chapter 42. Then he had seven more sons and three more daughters to replace the ten that he lost. You say, why not double? Because they were going to live forever in eternity, and in eternity he'd have all 20 of them. And then he doubled all of his possessions and gave him twice as much as he had ever given him before. And Job lived for 140 years with the blessing of God on his life because he came to the point where he finally realized what the suffering and the pain was all about. It was all about God. It wasn't all about me. It's not all about, yes, I have a lesson to learn. My friends have a lesson to learn. Uh, people will see God at work in my life in the most difficult, tragic, painful moments of my life. God is on display in those moments. And God is saying to people, I have not abandoned you. I have not turned against you. This is not necessarily an act of my judgment. Can my sinful behavior bring an act of judgment? Oh, yes, it can. 
But just because there are problems and difficulties doesn't mean that I'm under the judgment of God, that God is at work shaping and growing and developing my life, that God is speaking through me to others, and God is speaking to me, and God is calling to me saying, draw near to me, throw yourself on me, abandon yourself to me. And when you give yourself to me completely and totally, without reservation, without hesitation, when you come to the end of yourself, you'll find that I am there to meet your need, to walk you through your problems and difficulties and to display the grace and the glory and the goodness of God in your heart and in your life. What a lesson to learn from the books of poetry and in particular from the book of Job.